I think that testing has so much in common with what people are trying to achieve with SRE and with operations. If we come together as all people trying to deliver software, we would get so much further. Part of our move to continuous delivery was to look at the frequency at which something went wrong due to the size of the batch and the difficulty to identify and rectify anything that did. And so it went from two weeks as a deploy cycle to now it's about four or five times a day and it's one commit. Hi, I'm Liz Fong Jones. And I'm Charity Majors. And you're listening to Observability Cast, a monthly series about the art and science of making production systems observable, easy to maintain, and appropriately reliable. Allicast is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you have a specific topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us on Twitter at Allicast. That's O 11 Y C A S T, Allicast. Abby, you're a test engineer. How did you make your way to observability from, from all the way over there? Yeah, so I think that testing has so much in common with what people are trying to achieve with SRE and with operations and being able to ask interesting questions of our data and of our systems. So I actually got in for a much more uh, selfish reason, though, which was that as a test engineer, I was really sick of having to debate whether or not a bug should get fixed. I thought we should be able to figure out whether or not somebody will ever do this. And I really wanted to start being able to track what was going on in production and didn't have a lot of access on some of my projects. And so this was my way of finding more out and trying to get more involved. It's amazing how blind everyone has been flying in production, isn't it? It really is. I think the idea that we can validate everything before our users get hands on it is a fallacy for sure. And, and so as a test engineer, talk about being handcuffed if you don't get a chance to see how things are being used. Right. It's about the mission of what are you trying to do versus what tools and access do you have, right? Like your mission is to make sure people can use the software and it doesn't stop the instant it hits production. Absolutely. And my experience as a test engineer is starting as, oh, I'm going to write Selenium for everything to learning about how uh, building quality in through good discussions early on is key to learning about DevOps and building pipelines for quality delivery and now into the observability space. So I feel like once you've been using observability for a little while, it becomes really awkward and difficult to answer the question of why you would want it because it's so obvious. It's like once you've taken the blindfold off, the idea of going back like that's what we should be asking the question is how can you live without observability? How can you do your job without actually seeing the impact of what you've unleashed upon the world? Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe you should introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Abby Bangzer, and I currently work as a senior test engineer at Moo, which is based in London. And Moo is a company that actually deals with physical stuff. And like many of us that deal with only the digital world. Only the bits. It's fantastic. As a, as a new joiner, we have uh, two warehouses. And part of our journey as a new joiner is to go to the warehouse here in London and see where the products are made and, and understand that. So it's a big part of our company and our jobs. So if your product has an outage, then it means that the printing presses physically stop being able to work because there's no work for them to do or it's not working. Yep. I actually was on call uh, two weeks ago and there was a power outage in Rhode Island and really not much we could do about that, but we got paged and needed to try and help out our teams there. It's interesting to me how many of the early adopters of observability have been people with this link to the physical world, like people like delivery companies and stuff, because there are real consequences, like visceral physical consequences when out. Yeah, it's not like an ad serving where you just serve an empty ad and, you know, it's a tiny fraction of a cent of revenue loss. No, like the people stop being able to physically work and the machines stop working. Right. So Abby, you're a test engineer and you're on call. How did you come to that? <laughs> I was very excited to be in that role with that activity as a part of my job. So I believe that testing is about quality delivery and that that includes pre-production validation and adding test automation and exploratory testing, but absolutely also includes how 
the users are using your system and understanding that impact. And so I really wanted to get closer to that and software testers don't always get access. So when I saw an opening for platform engineer tester at Moo, it, it seemed like a great fit to make sure that I got that experience of on-call engineering. And Are all test engineers there on call? So we still have only a single team on call for overnights and weekends. Nice. During business hours, it's essentially having our software engineers on call because they're fantastic about jumping in and identifying things and and they do incident commanding and debriefing as well. But out of hours, it's just the platform team. So I would be the only test engineer on call for now. That's not a very typical thing for companies to have a platform test engineering role. That's super exciting. I hope more companies do that. Yeah, it's been amazing. So my first experience to being involved in this kind of work is being involved in the kind of quote unquote DevOps work, the pipelining work. And then from there, I worked with Keith Morris on an infrastructure project where he is a huge advocate of uh, diversity of roles being involved in infrastructure and platform and that kind of thing. Uh, And that really helped expose me. So what leads a company to decide to spin up a testing team? Like, I don't feel like I really have a good handle on that these days. Well, I can tell you how I never got a call back from a company, (laughs) which was that they were looking for their first ever test engineer and they had five developers. And I was like, wow, that's really early. Normally I talk to organizations looking for a first test engineer with... Oh, so you talked them out of that? Well, so... I thought I was giving them the benefit of the doubt. And I was like, what's made you think this? Like that you need a test engineer. Usually it's closer to like 50 or even 100 developers before you get one. They're like, we're starting to move slower because we need more quality. And I was like, okay, so do you see this role as writing tests for the developers or about coaching, you know, or building frameworks or whatnot? And they're like, writing tests for the developers. And I was like, oh. Oh my God, okay. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah, we run into that problem a lot with ops too, right? Like people think that if you add a sysadmin, the sysadmin will do all of the on-call and then the developers won't have to worry about the on-call. And it's like, no, no. no." Yeah, so I then shared my beliefs around testing and they very politely said, thank you so much, we'll get back to you and never heard from them again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so Liz and Abby, the two of you just got back from delivery conf. That sounded exciting. Yeah, so DeliveryConf is a first-year conference, and it has an interesting both premise and an interesting format. Abby, why don't you talk about the kind of premise of DeliveryConf as focusing specifically on CD as opposed to DevOps in general, and I'll take the conversation about the format. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I was really excited about it because I've attended DevOps days uh, a few times and absolutely loved the conversations and loved the topics. And some of the organizers from DevOps Days are actually the organizers for this delivery conf. And so they obviously think highly of DevOps Days as well. But they noticed that with the single track format and the larger format, that a lot of the topics revolve around culture and are more broad strokes. And they thought it would be worth diving into some of the details around continuous delivery and the technical gotchas in there. Um, And so that's really what drove the content of the conference and and it really came out in all the conversations. And it's really the first time that there's been a dedicated conference specifically around CICD as opposed to talking about CICD as part of the DevOps journey. Interesting. So like what were the talks that most resonated with you all? Or did they, did they have the unconference format? They didn't do an unconference format. They, instead, what they did was after every 30-minute talk, there would be a 20-minute discussion, group Ooh. discussion afterwards. Ooh. So kind of like a reverse panel. Panel, right, where you invite audience members to talk about what they learned from the talk, what they thought about the general area of the talk, and they made it so that the speaker does not have a dedicated microphone during it. So nice. you as a speaker are an equal participant in the conversation afterwards rather than being the That's person answering questions. Great idea. Yeah, I think it was fantastic. I've been involved in something similar at the CAST conference, which is the conference for the Association of Software Testing. And they have a a red, yellow, green kind of format where you can ask new questions or continue on the same thread of discussion, which I think is is a really awesome format, but would have limited us at DeliveryConf because they were able to record these discussions. And I think the value of being able to share those discussions was, was definitely worth having the format of coming to the front. 
even though I think the barrier of entry for some people was was there and they weren't super comfortable coming up and talking. Yeah, I think definitely one of the more interesting things would have been both having a recorded discussion as well as having the people have the option to break off into kind of side groups not recorded and have kind of mini discussions of their own. But it, you know, it was structured as in the form of what has been going well for you in this area, in your own experience, what has been going poorly, and what would you like to see happen over the next three to five years, right? That those were kind of the directions. So in terms of the actual, you know, talks that we especially liked, I, I don't know, Abby, which talk did you like the most? Uh, there, were, there were a good handful. So obviously being in testing, I want to give a shout out to, there were two awesome talks about including testing within delivery pipelines and how that works when doing exploratory testing, which is inherently manual, is not inherently offline, not automated. Uh, how do you do that when still trying to deliver quickly and via continuous delivery or deployment. That was uh, Lisa Crispin's talk, That right? was the first one was with, with Lisa, and I found it, to my point of SREs being so close to test engineers, we had a lot of chats about how, wow, test engineers, it's hard to get good ones because we don't always pay them as much as software engineers, but we should. And someone shouted from the crowd, like, oh, just call yourself a DevOps tester. And I was like, mm. oh, we're an SRE because <laughs> it's uh, ridiculously close in skill sets. And so, yeah, it was quite entertaining. Yeah, right. Like I, I know Charity has gone in this rent before about how when someone is a tester or someone is, is an SRE, that means that they have the skills of a software engineer and more. Yes. Didn't Google uh, in the early days, I, I've heard this story, I don't actually know if it's true or not, but that Google in the early days of SRE had a hard time getting enough people to be SREs. And then they looked at the pay rates and, well, they were paying them less than software engineers. And so they made the SRE pay bracket slightly higher than software engineers. And suddenly, voila, no more shortage. Yeah, uh, there was a program called Mission Control to encourage software engineers to come into SRE. And they would give you a, I think, 20% pay bump for your first year that you were trying out SRE. It's like capitalism might work in some <laughs> circumstances or something. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it's really silly. But I think that the whole dick swinging about, you know, my skills are better than your skills, whatever. I think that it speaks to the difficulty of doing outcome-based management, like being outcome-oriented, because that requires so much more of your leadership to actually you know, do the work of knowing what success means, defining it, being right about it, breaking it down, you know, helping coach people. You know, it, it's really hard work. And so we kind of push all of that onto the ICs. We're like, well, you're responsible for it. And then we suck at doing it and measuring it. And so we're like, well, let's look at some other thing that we can classify as being worth paying yeah, more for. Yeah, I think that's the other interesting thing. You know, when I first joined Honeycomb, I asked you, Charity, about kind of elements of the culture. And one of the things that Jinsu, the COO, and you did early on, which was defining the ladders up front, right? Like defining this is what we reward and promote people for. Yeah. And I was resisted it at first. I was like, well, that seems awfully big company of us. And then I realized, well, either we're compensating people for, you know, the impact that we hope that they will have, or we're compensating them for what? Their negotiating ability? That doesn't correlate with good engineering skills. Yeah, and I got the same pushback when I was defining the developer advocate ladder. It was like, you know what? We have one developer advocate, now we're going to two, and you want a ladder, right? And the answer is yes, yes, we need a ladder. we do, because otherwise people don't know how to grow. Like, we all crave this, right? Like, we crave the progress and achievement and mastery and growth. And it can be very, very frustrating to be stuck somewhere where nobody is willing to put in the work to, to tell you what that even is. I feel very strongly that job ladders are... They belong to the teams that they describe. They don't belong to the manager. They belong to the teams because, you know, you should be participating in this is what it means for me. This is what growth would mean, not having it told to you. And I think to wrap this conversation back around to testing, Abby, we were having a conversation about what good testing is not, right? Like it is not doing the tests for the engineers. How do you develop leadership? How do you develop kind of the skill ladder for testers? Yeah, I think I was going to say that that is that challenge around how to define output from people and from teams and from organizations that's so difficult is very true for any enabling role. And I think mm -hmm. test engineering is a, is a huge example of an enabling role. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the other talk at uh, Delivery Conf around testing was uh, Mariam Umar and Jez Humble were talking about how Mariam as a test engineer doesn't do the testing for people per se, but what she does is she can expose them to information that can help them realize gaps. Mm -hmm. So the most kind of common example there is something like uh, test coverage through like a tool like SonarCube, right? Having access to that 
making sure that tool's running, make sure, making sure people are aware of where the gaps in automated test coverage is, is one thing that test engineers can help shine a light on. But there's so much more to it, including telemetry and you know flappy alerts and all sorts of other things as well. I've always been really fascinated by the overlaps between test engineering and operations engineering, which is where I come from. You know, like we're we're both kind of software engineering adjacent professions that historically somewhat diminished, but you know, it's impossible to do your job without us. I mean, that's when I met you. I remember you saying, I really hope operations doesn't go the way testing has in that it doesn't become forgotten about or, or pushed against. It's it's included. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that was kind of a dickish thing for me to say, but but you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like the ops profession is, is kind of teetering on the precipice of people just saying, oh, well, that's, it's all technical debt. All operations work is just stuff that any software engineer should be able to do for themselves. It's just legacy. It's just mopping up after people. And it's like, how dare you, you know, say that my skills have no value, right? Like, it is a skill set that is worth cultivating on your team, and maybe it's worth cultivating on everyone on your team, but that doesn't make it, you know, any less valuable. But I do feel like testers, the test community did a bad job of selling themselves over the past decade or so because you all completely dropped off my radar until I met you, Abby. And then I was like, oh, wow, this is still a profession. And I felt kind of bad about that. But, you know, I don't want the same thing to happen to operational skills. And I'm really happy that testing seems to be like staging a bit of a comeback. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's about going to conferences like Delivery Conf and conferences where we share across roles. So I helped organize a European testing conference last year, and it's running again in a couple of weeks as its final final event. But it was a great example of where you get people across all the roles and you get testers and you get developers and you even get you know managers and you know it doesn't even just individual contributors. And, and that's really where the conversations happen, where you realize the vocabulary is actually just different, but you, the topics are the same. Yeah, we're solving the same convergent problems, just, you know, in different silos, and we need to break down the silos. We were joking at the at Delivery Conf of it would be a really entertaining talk at a conference one day if we were to get, you know, funny people, so not me from the testing community, but somebody who has, you know, good stand-up chat for testing software dev and operations and put them all in a on a stage together and, and maybe product as well and just have them start describing something and have someone else be like, wait a second, what you're talking about is actually this other thing. Like, and it's, it's just the different words. Right. And if we come together as all people trying to deliver software, we would get so much further. I have learned so much from being sitting closer to product engineers over the past couple of years and like trying to act like I am a product engineer from time to time, like thinking about things through that lens. Like it has really made me better at my craft. And I think the other element of this is the element of context, right? Like uh, you as a test engineer do not have the context that someone who is developing product necessarily has. And therefore it makes sense for them to write the tests corresponding to their context. Absolutely. It makes sense for people who are writing product to write the instrumentation because they have the context in their heads. The people who are closest to it need to do certain types of, of the work, but then it, as you get to like economies of scale, you also need someone to zoom out and look at the whole thing and like systematize and add regularity to it. One other thing I was going to say, it, I think that it does kind of sound sometimes like we're telling everybody that they need to know everything. You know, like that you need to be an expert in everything, like break down the silos. Well, but you need to be a product engineer and an ops engineer and a test engineer and all these things. And, and I think that what's actually happening is, um, like, because we have the same amount of attention and focus and brain capacity as, you know, as every other human throughout history said, we, we don't get more of that, right? But I, I think that what we're seeing is as specialization occurs, we're paging out stuff so that you don't need to worry about and think about just as fast as we're paging in things that you need to worry and think about, but, but on different scales. So like, for example, yeah, yeah. hardware. I know a fuck ton of things about hardware that I haven't had to access in my memory for like a decade or more, right? I used to go to the colo and flip the switch. I used to know how to like sling hard drives and all that stuff. Now my ops people work for Amazon. I freed up those brain cells, but now I have to like think laterally across more disciplines uh, around like product and testing and stuff. And, and I think that like it can be very daunting for people who, who listen to us sometimes and are like, are you literally just telling me I need to be an expert in everything? And the answer is no, because like we as an industry are developing 
we are progressing, we are developing better abstractions, we're developing more specializations, economies of scale, and so forth, that are surfacing entire industries to you through an API that you no longer need to be an expert in. So, Yeah, I think that was exactly going to tie into what I was going to say about my favorite talk. My favorite talk was the talk by Jessica Kerr, who talked about this uh, build versus buy conundrum and how we need to extract as much complexity from our day-to-day activities and yes. outsource it and make it someone else's problem. And they understand and carry all of that complexity so that we only have to think about that clean API yeah. and, you know, to a limited extent, know how to debug or at least to who to talk to in the event that that API doesn't work. That sounds like a great talk. Yeah, it was an amazing talk that really kind of eviscerated this notion of, oh, you have to build everything in-house artisanally. Right. Yeah, that one was fantastic as well. And I think that that speaks to the idea of having specialists on your team or not, right? You keep asking me about test engineering and how it relates. And all the time people will say to me like, well, I've worked on teams without a test engineer, or I think we should not have test engineers on a team. And every time I go, yeah, there's activities that need to get done. Whether or not those get done by somebody in the role of test engineer or QA or whatever you want to call it, I don't particularly care. But the idea that a software dev should both be able to test the quality of their implementation and think about the bigger picture is a lot of weight on their shoulders. And that's where having someone who has a specialty in keeping the big picture and making sure to shine the light on the things that need to get talked about and and focused on while letting everyone else kind of focus in their smaller areas is quite helpful. Every organization is like a special snowflake. It is, a, it is a special solution to a particular problem that has never existed before and will never exist in precisely that way again. You know, and this is where like the human creativity, this is where the creativity and management comes in, is trying to size up the problems in front of you and apply humans that don't fit in any neat boxes, but like trying to cover, you know, the surface area of the problem with the resources that you have. Yeah. Like there was a very wide range of people participating in the group discussions in Delivery Conf, right? Like there was everyone from senior principal engineers at Shopify, right, which is a multi thousand person organization, right, all the way down to folks like Danielle and myself who are on a 12 person engineering team. And we have very, very different constraints, right? The people at Shopify are much more worried about deduplication. How do they make sure that people don't build the same thing five times? Whereas we're just trying to figure out what are the things that we minimally need to build at all. And we had CEOs and we had engineers. And it was really great, uh, that diversity, for sure. Well, all right, you've sold me on the uh, on the conference. <laughs> yeah, I, I was arguing that we really should have sponsored it this yeah. year, and we'll sponsor it next year. But like, yeah, it was really great getting you know Jez Humble and Nicole Forsgren and and Rebecca, the CTO of Parson, the CEO of ThoughtWorks, right? Like getting all of these luminaries who had come up with these concepts and then to have them both talking about how they are seeing the concepts and also have people give them feedback on this is what they're actually experiencing in the field, right? That was really cool. One other talk that really resonated for me was Steve Pereira uh, spoke about where's the map to your pipeline, which boiled down to talking about value stream mapping your delivery process. And I think this is something that I learned I worked with ThoughtWorks for six and a half years, and and that was one of the ways in which we got understanding about our clients and understanding about their delivery processes, whereas mapping out all of the steps, both online and offline, that were needed to get any products into production. And so this was something that I've used before in the past, and I've even evolved into turning into tracing here at Moo, and we now trace our pipelines to understand the processes to get from development machine up to production. And... It makes such a difference when things are visible. Here at Moo, we were able to go to continuous delivery for our oldest application, our largest, oldest monolith, rather than a two-week release cycle because we actually took the manual steps and turned them into steps in our pipeline. Yes, 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 right? Like you don't have to fully automate everything as long as it's a checklist with an API. Maybe the API is fulfilled by a human, right? But there's a amazing talk uh, by Max Loebe, who is at Google, and I, this is a talk where he describes the process of turning a Google Cloud region turn up from a matter of months to a matter of weeks, right? And you don't get there by automating every single thing. You figure out what's important to automate. Yeah, you make a system. Humans can be part of the system, but it's about making it repeatable so you don't have to engage the creative, problem-solving, novelty part of your brain. Because that's what is open-ended. And it makes it visible. Yes. Like just understanding. So for us, it was the visibility of we would do these offline like wiki page fill-ins that are 
you know, everybody knows of these for delivery processes in most organizations. And it turns out that actually the timeline of when those got filled in versus when code was changing wasn't even aligning. So there were times when we would do like validation sign off, but actually the code changed after that sign off, but before it went to production. And no one even really knew that because they were so disconnected. So by making those manual checkoffs be attached to every single commit, what would happen is you might not want to validate every single commit, that's fine, but the commits you decide you want to push through to production, you can visibly see have been validated by any manual processes that you have, whether that be you know, security or exploratory testing or something else. I think there's also this interesting thing about batch sizes. At Honeycomb, we deploy things in batches of only one or two commits. And that reduces the surface area that has to be tested. Whereas if you're batching up who knows how many commits, then you have to run all of the exploratory tests on everything as opposed to just testing the thing that you changed. That was also a big part of our move to continuous delivery was to look at the frequency at which something went wrong due to the size of the batch and the difficulty to identify and rectify anything that did. And so now we deploy. So it went from two weeks as a deploy cycle to now it's about four or five times a day. And it's one commit. It's sometimes a big commit, depending on the feature and, and things, but it's one commit. Yeah. And many of my rants uh, about Friday deploys, I'm like, you know, the, if, if you can do one thing to make your deploys less scary, it's deploy one thing at a time, one change set at a time. Because the worst outages of my life have all been trying to like get bisect like which of this range of commits was responsible for the problem that we just pushed out. Nobody knows. And it can take days. And it's not even a problem necessarily of production reliability. It's also a problem of predictability of delivery. Mm -hmm. If you cannot get your individual commit in and instead it goes in a batch that either gets, you know, kicked back along with a hundred other things or it goes through, right? Like that's super unpredictable and it's, frustrating it's for you. It's very demoralizing and disempowering. The last thing I would add about it is it's just so amazing how expectations shift so quickly. So we went from a two-week release cycle to being able to, our pipeline took almost two hours when we first did the continuous delivery pipeline. And within a week of doing that pipeline, people were like, it should be faster. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, we could wait for two weeks if you'd like. <laughs> Your frame of reference um, shifts but, and suddenly once it is tractable, then like there's this relentless pressure for it to get smaller and smaller, which is great because you suddenly see all the things you can optimize and you see how much easier, but like it has to like get within shouting distance before. Right, like you have to have observability into your delivery pipeline yeah. and you have to have the agency to make changes to it. The first time that I saw somebody apply the, uh, the honeycomb tracing to their delivery pipeline, it blew me out of the water. I was like, why haven't we all been doing this all along? Yeah, it was fantastic. And, and that's, you know, one of the use cases for tracing for us. Um, can't say it's our major one, but yeah. we definitely use it. But yeah, I spoke to Robbie Russell about on the Maintainable podcast and was asking me what do I think about makes maintainable code. And my response was, a, you know, of course, everything other people have said around testability and all that. But it's actually people's desire to make change to it. And I think doing a refresh on something brings people's eyes to it and it creates that creativity of how to make it better. And that's why all of a sudden, from going from that two-week release cycle, going to continuous delivery, now people are seeing it and getting creative about how to make it better. And that is hugely beneficial for us on a lot of fronts. Mm, that was another thing about Jessica Kerr's talk that was super interesting, which was the idea of zombie code. The idea of if you cannot repeatedly deploy even the same code unchanged, then you have zombie code that's shambling around that you cannot modify, that you cannot security patch, that you cannot, you know, that you cannot make incremental change to because you've forgotten how to deploy it, you've forgotten how to build it. I absolutely loved that. And it fits with something that we've been doing recently as well with we have something like 40 pipelines within our platform team just because of all the small like docker images and tools and things it's hard we don't touch a lot of those very frequently uh and we've started running the master pipeline on those every week for every single one of them and it's always during business hours and it's actually tuesday to thursday only those three days of the week just so that you know bank holiday mondays here in the uk might as well try and aim for people being in the office if anything goes wrong. But uh, so far, nothing has gone wrong. And we've actually caught some things like package upgrades that cause an issue. And we're able to fix those on our time instead of having to do them immediately because something's on fire. 
I think there was also a thing that came up during Brian Lyles' talk on pipelines and standardizing pipelines is that when you have people who are treating their pipelines as this opaque thing of Jenkins pipeline number 32 doesn't work anymore, right? Help, Brian. It makes it harder to understand as opposed to here are the well-known Duplo blocks and Lego blocks that you can assemble a pipeline out of. Here's what they're for, right? So that it's either there is a bug in your pipeline or there's a bug in a pipeline component, but you can disentangle those two things. Yeah, his talk was fantastic as well. I've never never seen him speak, and he was very entertaining, very helpful. Uh, it was a great talk as well. I'm not necessarily sure that I'd agree with his assessment of all of your deploy pipelines have to be Kubernetes, but you know, I understand who pays his paychecks, and that's fine. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> but definitely, you know, pick one thing as an organization to standardize your deploy pipelines onto. Well, this has been super. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a, a long flight over, but absolutely worth going to DeliveryConf uh, and really hope that they, they do it again next year. Thanks for joining us for this conversation. If you're interested in being a guest on a future show, or if you have a specific topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us on Twitter at OllieCast. That's O-1-1-Y-Cast. To learn more about HeavyBit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library. It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tool companies and other industry leaders. Hope to see you next time. 